So, in Luke 3.38 as an example, Adam is referred to as a son of God. In John chapter 10 verse 33-34, Christ says, Is it not written in your scriptures that you are God's? And to whomever the word of God has been sent, that I have said I am the son of God, meaning one who represents God. In Exodus chapter 4 verse 20... Okay. What that means is that God made man in his own image. That's why we all have the similar features that we have. We have nose, we have mouth, we want oxygen, okay? Except the eyes and ears, right? And we all have hands. So we are making the only way he did. But the characteristics of his behavior, which is the fruit of the Holy Spirit, is what Matthew chapter 5 is saying. Blessed are they that are poor in spirit, because in the spirit, when somebody is sitting, you are hard to be love by the John. But you're still not looking at the definition of what I'm trying to explain to you. What I've tried to show to you, if somebody is referred to as the son of God in the Bible, just like Jesus is, or just like other prophets are, like Jacob, like um, so, Adam. Yeah, so um, all it, all it. Let me explain this to you. Let me look at this way. Because I see where you're going. To be a child, that person must have your, you must have his, your values, right? You are a parent, I'm guessing so. So your values, you give it to your children, right? They are by by your rules. See, it doesn't necessitate that because you know what? Let me explain something. It's going to be interesting for you. You know, the, the New Testament, it was written, do you know which language it was written in first? Greek. Excellent, Koine Greek. Now, when it was written in that particular language, at that time, in the Greek, you know where Jesus lived in Palestine at the time? The surrounding power were the Romans and the Greeks. Their concept of Son of God differed from the Israelites. They understood Son of God in a literal sense, that one who is like a mighty person, but he's got godly characteristics. Yeah, but, but, but amongst... But amongst the Israelites, their definition of a son of God was simply one who represented God. That's it. Not carrying a literal understanding, unlike the Greek or Roman world, as to how they understood it. Try to absorb the information and think about carefully what I'm saying to you. So you've got two differing people. You've got the Israelites, who believe the term son of God in their community is simply meant one who represents God. However, the, the surrounding people who were in power, the Romans and the Greeks, their concept of Son of God was literal, that a, di that a divine beings living in heaven who were semi-gods. So Jesus, as far as they were concerned, had that title. But actually, the definition, as I said to you, think about this very carefully. What I want you to think, Matthew 5, 9, all, all it is saying, because Matthew was spoken to a Jewish audience. So when he makes reference, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the sons of God. This is a ubiquitous title, meaning a title widespread to those who represent God. And I'm giving you examples. I'm giving you that, for example, Adam is referred to as the son of God in the Bible. Same thing as Jesus in Luke chapter 3, verse 38. In Exodus chapter 4, verse 22, same thing about Jacob, son of God. Now, does that mean they're God? No. What it simply means is are those who represent God. Now one more last point, then you can then you can come in. Listen carefully, listen carefully to this point. Very important. You've got the term son of God. And then you compare that, listen carefully, with the term God the Son. Very similar but subtle distinctions. Very important. God the Son was a second person of the Holy Trinity. Jesus in the form of that's never mentioned for Jesus in the Bible. The title, God the Son is not mentioned for anyone, including Jesus. This was a later formulation in Christian history at the various councils. So, the t so they understood the term Son of God, the Israelites, as one who just represents God. And they're giving you definitions. Look, one definition is in Matthew 5, 9, and then Jesus says in John 10, 33, is it not written in your scriptures, you are God's? So all that means are people who do who God's work, they are referred to with that honor, honored title. And it actually comes from a Greek word called huios. How it worked was like this, I'll explain to you very quickly, just a few seconds. At the time of the Greek Romans, if you had a child who was a servant in your home, officially his title was servant. But out of affection, the master would call him son. Huios. Greek word, huios. So what they literally did, they took it literally. The Greeks took it literally, even though it simply meant servant. That is why the term is interchangeable. Son of God, 
servant of God. Son of God, servant of God. Are you following what I'm saying to you? Does that make I'm sense? Not, I'm not going to be 100% with you. I'm not going to go back to what I said earlier. But in Genesis, throughout the Old Testament, to the Revelation, to, to this day, people are sinning, right? Jesus paid the price on the cross because our flesh has a sinful nature. Anything that contradicts in the mind the word of God makes the person carnal because the person is not of the spiritual, how does he have spiritual understanding of God? The way to understand God is by repentance. Repentance means to change the way you need your perspective and see his own standard. Do you understand? So when you say son of God and son of God, when you become son of God, you are the way you transition from being a, an outsider, I would say, okay, or a servant. To be a servant, to be a child of God, that brings you to pray. Because you have people with commandments, you have people with this commandment, they will be a God who will abide with you. And then you transition to having the quality that I in Matthew chapter 5, and in Matthew chapter 5, verse 22 to 23. And that is the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is what we said in Matthew chapter 5. So that's what it means. It means one and rep what you're saying in effect is that the term in Matthew 5, 9 shows one who represents God. You accept that, don't you? Blessed are the peacemakers. So peacemakers in the plural means those who do peacemaking or those who do God's work, they are referred to as sons of God from that, from that definition, you see. Okay. So that's why Christ would be also a peacemaker, peacemaker hence he would be a son of God. And those that don't quarrel, yeah. and those who are calm, who are self-controlled, who doesn't quarrel with people, let them add in your own heart that you didn't think they would in their heart against anybody from the world they got wrong. Like what happened to Cain and Abel that Cain killed his brother. That's what that means. You might have to be the box of the flesh is good for all of them. That's why in Genesis chapter 19, it says that we go back to the ground, we go back to the floor, meaning that the flesh is decay. That's why you see all the bones in the floor. The flesh becomes rotten by mucus and all what more. Do you understand what I mean? Yeah, I think so. It's so that's a bit of noise, is it? You don't need to walk in the flesh. You need the Holy Spirit to help you. Yeah. But you see, this is a bit, I mean, the, the Holy Spirit issue, I've always found a bit confusing. Because it's I think it. I you think. You need to change your mindset and ask God to help you to understand this world itself. When you have an encounter and you have God to meet him spiritually in between, or he talks to you audibly, or he talks to you in your heart, it's not when you understand the word. But if you are looking at it from your point of view, and you see that the first thing, but I see that he, some of your Quran words correspond, and some of these clashes I've heard from people. I've never read Quran because I don't want to. But um, but I'm really sorry. I am not going to do this kind of thing. I am going to stand my ground of being a Christian and a child of God. But I understand where you're coming from, but I think maybe it's a yes or a yes to you or for you all to pray to God and ask Him to do the truth to you. How do you do the prayer? How do you pray? I call upon the name of Jesus. But doesn't it say in Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 4 and 6 that they bow before God and then they kneel in prostration to God? That's the culture of the Israelites. Which isn't, which is, it wasn't Jews, Jesus from the Israelites? You have to understand that Jesus came from the Levites. But they're still Israelites. They are the Israelites as a nation, but they have 12 different tribes. But they still follow the same Mosaic law. Jesus came to fulfill the law. That's why in this day and age, we don't go by the law, we go by the Holy Spirit. But, but what we're saying is that Jesus said he came only to 
fulfill the, not to change the law. So if you say, if I, when I asked you, how do you pray? And it's defined in Matthew, sorry, in Nehemiah, chapter eight, verse four and six, we're told you to bow first and then kneel in prostration. Why did I mention that verse? It's because this is how Muslims pray as well. You can kneel, you can bow, which is what is going on for you. But what matters as well is your composure of your heart. Are you ready? So you do accept that Nehemiah verse? So what, what I'm trying to establish to you is prescribing to you how to do so. It's interesting why I'm saying this, because we're, you're ordered to first bow and then get up and then go in prostration. Also, exactly the way Muslims do. But also, in Matthew chapter 15, the verse 8, it says, but that doesn't negate that doesn't listen to what you've said I agree I agree but what I'm saying to you it, it doesn't still negate what you still have to do so you're right the heart has to be affected by the prayer by the method I agree with you so Matthew 14, it doesn't negate Nehemiah 8. All it shows is that if you pray and you do those acts and then you don't get effective of the heart, then the prayer is worthless. But if you perform the prayer, which is the designation, so therefore the heart should be affected. So, but, uh, Yeah, no, you're right. But that, like I said, I agree. What you're, we agree, we're in agreement here. All I'm trying for you to understand is that the, pr the, the prayer is still a prerequisite. It's a necessity. Yes. And then, by default, the prayer should affect your actions and your heart, like you said. But that, but the, the prayer still is a compulsion. And that's that's. So, but what I found, it's like it's very specific. You see, so it's given a specific order. I mean, we are Muslims, as you know, so we do exactly as prescribed there. It's interesting, we first of all bow up, then kneel in prostration. In effect, why have I mentioned this? It's because we believe as Muslims that God sent many prophets. Abraham, Moses, Solomon, David, Jesus, peace be upon them. Gre Solomon is not a prophet, he was a king. A yeah, king, but... David was the priest and a king. Yes, but he was also a prophet. But David was a David was a prophet though as well. Shall I prove it to you? I mean, I can show it to you as well. I don't want to embarrass you because you know what happened. It was one really famous. It was really famous um, evangelical in speakers' corner. He said, "Show me where does it say David is a prophet?" And, it, and we showed it to him. But it's still so he's a prophet. Yeah, so he referred to the prophet. The position of a prophet is to prophesy. Yes, I agree, yes. Okay, so God that gives individual the gifts. That's why I said the person is the Holy Spirit to be able to do the work of the Spirit. How do you know if you have the Holy Spirit? We know by the fruit. So what about in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 40, where Paul says, I think I have the Holy Spirit, meaning he's not sure if he's got it. Why is Paul a proponent of the Holy Spirit, unsure if he has the Holy Spirit? You would assume he's been blessed by uh, God and therefore he would be sure of having the Holy Spirit. But it appears to me he's not sure if he has it, from that verse particularly. What, what's your understanding on that? I, I can see, I'm going to hear all day, I don't have all day, I have a Okay, I, 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 I don't want to delay you in that case. I don't but you know in the Old Testament and in the Gospels, the Holy Spirit never speaks. How do you know then it's the Holy Spirit? There is no way at all in the Old Testament and in the Gospels, Mark, Matthew and Luke, where the Holy Spirit actually speaks. So how do you know then what is how he sounds like? In Matthew, the part where I know that Jesus the Holy Spirit did not 
But there is no definition in the Bible which tells what is the fruits of the Spirit. The only where I am aware of is in John chapter 14, which makes mention that the, the Spirit which speaks the truth on who Jesus is, that is a form of a true Spirit, meaning who testifies that Jesus is, is, the, is the Christ. In 1 John chapter 2 verse 22 and in 1 John chapter 4 verse 9, the one who testifies that Jesus has come in the flesh is of the Spirit. But the one who rejects that is the Antichrist. But we, we as Muslims, we affirm Jesus came in the flesh. He was the Christ. That definition in Genesis, in um, 1 John 2, 22, often I hear my Christian friends saying, do you know what? You have to believe Jesus is, your, is God and your Lord and Savior. Otherwise, you are an Antichrist. But I say to them two things. The Bible itself defines what an Antichrist is in two places, which I made mention to you. 1 John chapter 2, verse 22, and in 1 John chapter 4, verse 9. It does not say the Antichrist is the one who denies that Jesus is God. It just says the Antichrist is the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ, meaning the Messiah, which we, as Muslims, we affirm that. Yeah. Okay, what does 1 Thessalonians 2 say? It talks about the nature of Antichrist, that you have a prophet, a false prophet, you have all the three things that is copied what God is doing. Pardon? The Antichrist are those that are under a false prophet, but they are working under the devil. So, yeah, but that will be a big revelation as well. Okay, but then you would look at what their fruits are. That's the way to testify of them. So, the, so the, the fruits of them will be that they would call you away from worshipping God or they would call you away from Christ. But Islam, it, it calls you to God, the one true God, and then it affirms Jesus as being the Messiah. What I'm trying for you to understand is the, def, the definition of those who are antichrists are the ones who reject that Jesus came in the flesh. But Muslims, we say yes, he came as a human being. In the, what else do you, what specific verse are you referring to which says that the one who rejects Jesus as being God or whatever, he is of the Antichrist? I'd like to see this verse. Okay. I've read it. Is it the one that talks about how the thief of the, how they will come in the thief of the night? That's it, that's 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. That when the when the um, when the end comes, Paul says that he will come like a thief in the night. Yeah, that's in reference to Christ's second coming, when everything will be finished. Yes. No, it's in Thessalonians as well. Thessalonians is the first book of the New Testament. Okay, no problem. You attend your meeting. Nice speaking. Take care. So. Uh, pleasant conversation with uh, this nice Christian lady. So, um, you know, we go through the main stuff again. They're not always familiar with the terminologies and they seem to go off on particular tangents. But inshallah, Allah guide her. Assalamu alaikum.